Um, so my day job is as a researcher, a cybersecurity researcher. Um, but the whole reasoning is because recently, if any of you have gone through like Facebook ads and stuff like that, you'll notice there's a lot of uh, companies, right, renovation companies that offering packages, right? Smart switches, smart lights, and all those kind of things. Uh, reason is, it's available, it's cheap, right? So why do you need this presentation? So first things first, take a look at it. This is a very quickening pace of adaptation of IoT. Especially here in Singapore, because of the infrastructure that's available to us as homeowners, this uptake of deployment for IOTs at home will go up really, really, really quickly, all right? So this is the projected amount of IOT devices that is gonna be online. It's a huge amount. So for a researcher like me, every single one of those devices is a point of contact, a point of compromise, okay? So like I was saying, new HDB houses comes pre-wired for connectivity. If you're gonna buy a new house, and you actually take a look at what is offered, please take a look at this. It says, services provided as part of your HDB houses. Gas, exposed sanity stacks, concealed electrical wiring, television points, data points. Okay, your new houses, those of you about to get married, go ahead and take in your BTOs, right? Your house is fully wired with Cat6. I know, I tested because I just got my key this year. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it's fully tested, fully wired up, all right? There's no more phone lines. In fact, all the phone lines previously, prior to this, all your phone line jacks were actually Cat5 E cables using only single pair, right? So that's why there's electricians going around offering service. You want to change your telephone line to data line. It's actually because of that, right? Really come pre-wired. So 75% of IoT attacks target routers. So that's why today's talk is going to cover mostly on your routers, all right? There's an increase in attacks on connected cameras, all right? And please, for God's sake, don't set your username to root and password one two three four five six. <laughs> oh, you'll be surprised, right? I just did a PT against a power grid somewhere. Uh, default password, uh, admin, admin. Thank you very much. <laughs> Fastest PT engagement ever. All right. So some of it is due to mistakes in deployment. Some of it is due to mistakes in development. All right, so we as homeowners, we need to decide how are we gonna implement such devices into our house. All right, we actually have to be very conscious nowadays on how we deploy such devices. So examples of high profile attacks. DDoS, Singapore, well done, okay? So this was, oh, I was involved in this. Uh, I was in sock when this hit. Oh, that was fun days. Not going home for 48 hours. Okay, so what happened was, um, it was IP cameras, basically. Okay, so there was a bonnet going around. The IP camera was not configured correctly out of the box. The software was more of a push first to market kind of codes. Uh, you all know, huh? Okay, startups, huh? Okay, so they exposed everything. Botnet came in, hello. Hard-coded username and password, thank you very much. Took over the IP cameras, and then on that day and date, C2 said, right, let's go and whack this bugger. Everybody sent out a packet, all right? So unfortunately for Sahab, uh, most of those IP cameras was on their network lah. Okay, so Starhub got a large chunk of it, all right? It was going up to like a oh, few petabytes worth of data 
at one point, right? So really the scrubbers were working full tilt at that day. Uh, NAS. NAS is quite common, crypto. So Synology was hit where if you expose your Synology NAS, uh, where is Mr. Okay, la, uh, HSG guys, uh, please update our NAS, thank you. Okay, so Synology was hit. Basically, if you expose your Synology out to the internet, which you really shouldn't, please don't do this kind of things. All right, it got ransom back. But here's the thing. The whole idea of this talk, no, it's not only just to tell you how you should deploy, but it's actually to dispel FUD. You all heard of the term FUD before? So in security industry, we have this thing called FUD, called fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Right? The thing is, we in the cybersecurity and technology profession, there's a big role in spreading FUD. Right? So you all seen this before? Yeah. I work in IT, so my house has mechanical locks. Is there such a thing as a non-mechanical lock? Mechanical windows? Is there such a thing as a digital window? <laughs> Routers using OpenWRT? Yes, I, I do use OpenWRT, but not because of what you think. No smart home crap. No Alexa, Google Assistant. No internet-connected thermostats or internet-connected ICRI. I don't know why I bought that ICRI also. Okay, so tech enthusiasts, everything in my house is wired to the internet of things. I control it all from my smartphone. My smart house is Bluetooth enabled and I give it voice command via Alexa. I love the future. It's awesome. Okay, programmers and engineers, right. The most recent piece of technology I own is a printer from 2004, and I keep a loaded gun ready to shoot it if it makes an unexpected sound. What? You're the people who actually build these things. So this is FUD. And if you go into cybersecurity Twitter, okay, wait, wait, wait. Before you go onto Twitter and doing hashtag cybersecurity, if you don't have a very strong stomach for drama, don't do it. Okay, it's like telenovela 24-7. All right, it's really, really bad. So, there is this triangle of security. So, we call it security, capability, and features. Okay, so those of you doing development work, all right, and if you subscribe to the DevSecOps mentality, right? So, the idea is that you must have enough features, you must have the capability, but it must be secure. If you're a sysadmin, you're also doing the exact same thing, right? So here's the thing. You see that white dot in the middle? That's where your user is, your user experience is. So a lot of security people would think, right, let's just shift it up there, which takes away capability and features. It makes the user experience not so nice. So what do you think will happen, or what do you think the user would do? Any guesses? Hmm? Stop using the software. If you're lucky, they'll stop using the software. If not, you'll get this. So apply GPO, awesome. Apply password policy, fantastic. Uh, yes, yes, a bit more. Yes, oh, I forgot to put a character. NAC and ACLs, yes. Oh, no. Oh, DLP. Oh, data leakage protection. Don't bring your work home, huh? Fully certified. No one can get in. Right? Sure. Okay. So, if you do that, your user is going to be the cat. Let's be honest here. We all have done this. We have been the cat. But we just need to get the job done. Bugger the security, all right? We don't care. The job of a security professional is actually to do this. We're supposed to squeeze the triangle so that the distance between security, capability, and features are closer to each other. So that a person can do the job and doesn't have the security features in their face. 
That is the whole point. All right? So I hope I've dispelled some of this. Fat. So we're going to do the actual talk now. Okay, now wait. Hang on. Let's go back to this. Uh, any of you been going to the shopping centers lately? Then you see a certain very brand name security company peddling smart home protection. Anyone? No, it's a small box about this size, yay big. No? Okay. So the reason why I came up with this talk was because I was walking around and then I saw that. And the first thing in my mind was like, why? Why do you need this? Okay? Okay, la. it's a bit snake oily, la, eh? to put it nicely. All right? Why do that? Why spend a large amount of money when the way to protect yourself has been known for a very, very long time? It has been used in workplaces. It's just network segregation. Okay? But there are certain things we need to consider, and that is threat modeling. Let us be realistic. We are not going to go out, buy a hardware firewall, all right? we're not going to buy a Cisco firewall, we're not going to buy a Juniper firewall, all those kind of things. We're not going to put it in the house, okay? unless you're doing a lab. Okay? There's no point. There's no such thing as perfect security. Security is special. All right? We are literally special snowflakes. You know, I know why? People who work in security are the only people who are doing a job where it is 100% guaranteed that they will fail at their job. You will never be 100% safe. You will be never 100% secure because security is not a finite state machine. It is not Okay, I give the talk on security to all my co-workers, they know the password policy, they know not to touch phishing emails. Right, we are completely safe. Tell the CEO, I need my bonus. No such thing, huh? It is fluid, it keeps moving. Realistic threat model. Why? Ransomware, generally targeted, highly dependent on prevalence of cryptocurrency in the targeted group. Do you notice that Singapore doesn't have a lot of ransomware? Because crypto is not very prevalent in Singapore, right? I want money. Why am I going to attack a poor fellow who is not going to be able to pay me? Waste my time. His entry in my C2, I might as well put another entry of someone who I know who does crypto, right? Mostly via phishing. Gmail, Outlook, very good at identifying phishing email nowadays, all right? Mostly, if they are not through emails, they are targeting your NAS. Again, you should not be exposing your NAS okay, to the internet. Bot network is what we should be more worried about. They're generally non-targeted. Okay, they are opportunistic in nature. All right? They're limited risk to your home if you do things correctly. Okay, they don't actually attack your home. They don't want anything from your home. They just want to use your computing resources that your devices provide. Okay, that's all that they want. So let's talk about network segmentation. So what is network segmentation? If any of you already did networking at work or at school, it's just a very quick refresher. Is there segmenting a network into subnets or zone and controlling access and flows between the subnets using firewall roles? Why? Because we are lazy. What did Bill Gates say? Huh? Hire the most laziest person you can find because you'll find the most efficient way to do something, right? So why we do network segmentation is the cheapest in effort cost to implement. But the cost to the attacker is disproportional. All right? In, in terms of effort, if I go in and you do proper firewalling, for me to pivot from, let's say, the IoT network into the home network where I can get juicy stuff. I don't know why I use the word juicy. Yeah? Okay? Okay, it's very, very hard. It's, I'll be like, eh, okay, let's find another software target. Right, so we want to take the least effort to give us the maximum effort in returns. So, some prep work, one, stuff your router, so what does it mean? Setting your router up in such a way that it does not respond to request probes on the WAN interface in any way. Okay, there are, okay, if you go to 
cyber security Twitter uh, there's a very big argument why bother stealthing no use no good stealth is good it works in for me I think stealth works because if you're going up against scripts all right scripts expect certain reply and response when they do probing so if they don't get that response you're just wasting their effort again my idea is to increase the cost of them trying to get into me but if I waste their effort the script will have time out go find it again so what does it do it basically looks this in your router there is a settings that you can do you can either accept a connection or a packet you can reject or you can drop when you do a rejection you are actually resending a packet reply I repeat that a reject will reply and say no I'm rejecting you so the script will like oh you exist Okay, cool. I'm going to wet you more. <laughs> drop. I receive, I just drop. I keep quiet. That's why it means to stealth. I don't even give you the reply. I'm not going to send you the reset package at all. All right? So this is what it means. So how do we do? Uh, oh, by the way, you cannot do this with the routers provided by your ISP. I tried, doesn't work. You need to go and get, just get a cheap TP-Link C7 Archer. Okay, all my talks are based on that. All right, it's cheap. Flash open WRT on it. Job's done. What, $60 done, certain. Okay, go to your firewall setting, go into the LAN zone, the WAN zone, set it to drop. Done. Stealth, done. Okay? Second, UPNP. My God, this thing has been around for God knows how many years. So why is UPMP? Universal Plug and Play is a set of network protocols which by right does a lot of funny things. It does a lot of funny things. It's actually an umbrella of protocols. So. UPMP does not describe any mechanism for authentication by default. That's one. So for those who do not know how UPMP works, this enables any device services application to send a request to another device and it will be accepted and honored. Okay, it uses a REST API. Here's the bloody damn thing about UPMP. If I, device A, go to the router that accepts UPMP and say, please open this port for me. Another UPMP device goes in, does a malicious scan and asks what other UPMP port has already been opened beforehand. He can then use the port that was opened initially for me. It's called UPMP port hijacking. Okay? And most of the time, it's because of poor implementation by vendors. All right? Which, and we're talking about vendors in terms of not only at the end devices, but also on the router side. All right? Certain companies, routers, or the UPMP implementation, very dodgy. You're not supposed to accept UPMP initialization requests from the WAN side. But for some weird reason, certain routers do that. Okay, so in OpenWRT, by default, you don't even have UPMP installed. Okay, for those of you who don't know how actually UPMP works, it works like this. If I'm a UPMP capable device, I will tell the router, these are the ports that I want. It will open the ports, and then it will send a packet to an external server. That external server will then try to call to me, who is inside, to confirm that yes, the port is open. Can, can you see the problem there? Okay. All right. So there's two ways of doing it, single point and multi-point. What is single point? Single point is like if you're still staying in the old houses, you only have one network point. So what we're going to use is we're going to take one access point and provide multiple networks from a single access point. So we are going to create a virtual AP, and we're going to call it the IoT network. So if you're using OpenWRT, I think DDRWRT also looks the same. You go in, go into the network, go into wireless, choose whether you want to run on 2.4 or 5, it makes no difference to me. Click it. Go in, create your new virtual AP, give it a name, in my case I gave it the name IoT, and then you'll create it, see? You can see IoT, give it, please, uh, even though it's IoT, please put a password to it. 
That's because it's IoT and you're lazy, you don't want to put password. Oh, one more thing about SSID. Hiding SSID makes no difference. Huh? There's no point hiding SSID. Huh? <laughs> if someone is actually attacking you through your SSID, you have a very, very big stalker problem with it. Huh? You, you need to call the police with it. Okay? So just create an IoT, give it a password, fine. But it doesn't exist yet because it's, it's, it's not an interface that packets can go in and out from. So create a new interface, call it IoT again, create it as a static address, and then give it the wireless LAN interface that you have just created. Cool? Oops, sorry, 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 a bit too fast. Okay, so now it's been set, give it a static IP address, give it some random IP address, all right? Give it DHCP, same thing, same thing. All right, and then you create a firewall zone for it. So now it exists. So as you can see, you have an IoT that allows it to go to WAN, default, drop, drop, same, same. Okay? So then you need to create a custom rule because right now, some IoT devices have to go to the internet. Some. Uh, if they don't touch the internet, uh, you just refuse to work. <clears throat> Samsung. Okay? Uh, it just it has to call the C2. La. Okay, Samsung, LG, all this. It's for your um, to enhance your user experience. We need to get some telemetry data from. Okay? So if you refuse to let it go to the internet, you won't let it. So right now, anything within this network will just talk to each other. You cannot go anywhere. So you need to get a custom rule. So that you can get DNS services from your router. So you go to wireless network, go to custom firewall rule, open port on router, TCP 53. Cool. So allow it from IoT to the actual device itself. That's it. One way. Okay. Do it the same thing for your DHCP because if not, your devices will not get an address. But this is how you're going to control it. You're going to create a custom rule. That says anything on my home network can talk to the IoT network because why your app still needs to talk to your IoT devices to do the control, command control. All right? So if I, in my home network, cannot connect to the IoT devices, why would I buy IoT devices? All right? So this is how you do it. You're applying access control list, network access control list. So in this case, it's a very bad example. Huh? This is basically saying any machine on the LAN side can go in. In reality, what you should do is you decide on one device, a tablet usually, that you put in your house, and then you specify specifically only this tablet. That is the proper way of doing it, okay? So this is the special rules that you should get at the end of the day. So at the end of the day, one point, traditional houses, all HDB houses, you have one data point, put that router there, Two access points, one for home, one for IoT. And the two will never meet. Okay, they will meet. Only home can go to IoT, not the other way around. All right? Multi point. Multi point, we're going to play a bit more differently because in the new houses, you have a data cabinet, right? You all know the data cabinet, right? You got a lot of points. So you're going to leave this router inside. And this is where your ISP router works. You're going to convert it into a pure dumb AP, right? So you're going to go into the switch, take one of the ports, okay, and assign it to another VLAN, all right? Again, it's not inside there, so you have to create it. Create the IoT LAN, same old, same old, all right? Everything is the same. So now you have two. One is IoT for wireless, one IoT for LAN. So, okay, in reality, if you're doing the multi-point one, the IoT wireless doesn't exist. Cool. So I do the exact same rule. Everything is exactly the same. All right? So the only difference now is you need to choose and you have to sacrifice one of your LAN ports in your HDB house to be where all the IoT will connect to. Okay? So basically what you're doing is that you split the two network 
And if, let's say, the IoT devices gets compromised, which they will get compromised, okay, it won't affect your home network. But if you itchy finger and go and click on your home network, a phishing email, and then it goes out and find your IoT devices, I don't, don't look for me. Huh? Okay, if you go and itchy finger, huh? I can help you. Okay, so that's it. If you're going to look for me on Twitter, that's my handle, Elingard. If you're on IRC, I'm Mystic Hexer. Why not Elingard? It's because I lost my password for my Nick surf. <laughs> cannot recover. Yahoo killed my email account. I cannot recover it. Okay, fine. Okay, so I'm using Mystic Hexer. So you can hit me up on either Twitter or IRC. All right, so that's it. I hope this talk will explain to you more about fat. Actually, it's more about that. So that when you read things on the news, right, scary things about cybersecurity, you'll think about it, wait, does this actually apply to me? All right, and if you're going to apply IoT at your house, to be very conscious on how you put it in. All right, I hope this short talk was useful for you. Thank you very much. Oh, I have questions. Wow. Okay. Well. How do you secure your IoT devices knowing that they are not compromised? How do you know that your IoT devices are not compromised? <laughs> Is that chicken and egg question? La? It's no, okay, look, the, the definition of a vulnerability is that, or compromised IoT devices is that, whether there's a vulnerability and whether someone has found that vulnerability or not. You see, like what I said, security people are the only group of people who knows that we are going to fail at our job. It's a given. It will be secure today, a few years down the Okay, look, sudo dash i minus one. Really? Really, for those who are laughing, you know what I'm talking about. Really, people, minus one, and you get root? Come on. How many years has that bug been in there? OK, uh, how secure are the default ISPs given? They are very feature limited. They don't do a lot of things. Are they secure for what they do? Yes. They have the firewall functionality, just make sure you turn it on. But if you want to do advanced things like having IoT deployment, I suggest just use it as a dumb AP. That's it. Last? Huh? Which router? Oh, yeah, I cannot answer this one. Lah. Which router brands are good in security? <laughs> cannot say it openly. Lah. Don't break my rice bowl can. <laughs> oh, why the model of the. Okay, the model that. We, well, I say we lah, me lah. I usually recommend is the TP-Link Archer C7 series. Okay, if you go to Hackerspace right now, there's a bunch of them all over the place. Huh? Okay, it's cheap. It does the job well. It has a lot of, it has enough uh, storage inside that you can install third-party packages and OpenWRT works well on them. That's it. Okay? All right, thank you so much. So, uh, thanks, Aswan.